welcome to another episode of Chax Chat. Join Chad Chilius and me, Dax Castro, where each week we wax poetic about document accessibility topics, tips, and the struggle of remediation and compliance. So sit back, grab your favorite mug of whatever, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Chax Chat podcast. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we wanted to remind everybody that coming up pretty soon, next month in March, uh, Dax and I are going to be at the CSUN Assistive Technology Conference in Anaheim, California. And uh, we're really excited because we just printed up a bunch of amazing sticker sheets that we're going to be giving away at the conference. Um, So if you plan on attending uh, CSUN, stop by our booth, which is uh, booth number 432, and uh, say hello. Say say hi to us. We'd love to meet you guys. Uh, we'd love to 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 hear about you know your accessibility journey, and uh, just uh, would love some time to chat with you. So hopefully you're going to be there, and uh, we look forward to seeing you out at CSUN. Uh, my name is Chad Chilius. I'm an Adobe Certified Instructor as well as Director of Training Solutions and Principal at Chax Training and Consulting. And my name is Dax Castro. I am Adobe Certified PDF Accessibility Trainer, and I am Director of Media Productions here at Chax Training Consulting. And Chad and I are both certified as Accessible Document Specialists. And if you'd like your certification too, head on over to accessibilityassociation.org slash certifications and get yours. How you doing, Chad? Doing well. Doing well. Awesome. Most of the snow has melted. We got about eight inches of snow on, uh, I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was I was telling you that shortly after it got done snowing, the sun came out and started melting most of it. So we're those, still those raining. Are the snows, those are the snows we like to get, you know, yeah. <laughs> the ones that don't well, hang around too long. Because that makes it mush long. though, right? You get, you get a lot well, of mush. Well, listen, on the East Coast, snow is usually mush as soon okay. as it falls. It's okay. wet snow. It's heavy snow. Uh, the, the last snow we got was actually powder. And oh. that, that's like really uncommon, at least, at least as South far as I am in Pennsylvania, uh-huh. my son lives in New Hampshire and they often get a lot of really good powder, but down here it's usually wet, heavy snow. So gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Cool beans. Well, let's get right into the topic today. So today we're going to talk about nested structures. So we're talking about things like lists and TOCs and tables tags that have other tags inside them and how that works, right? So recently in the Facebook group, I got a little bit of education because I improperly assumed I mixed up a few things. And this is why we keep up on the standards, guys. You never stop learning. Even someone like me and Chad, we we often, you know, we, we go back and we do deep dive. In fact, before this podcast, we did a little deep diving to make sure we were on track. And what we realized, what we uncovered was in a list structure, it is perfectly fine to have the L, which is your list container, the LI, which is your list item. And then inside that, I was under the impression that if you use the LBL, which is the label, like your bullet or number, whatever, that you have to have the L body, that both of them have to be together, that you can't just have an L body. Obviously, you probably would never have just an LBL, but that if you have one, you have to have the other. And I was wrong. We looked it up in the PDF UA standard, which if you guys don't have a copy of the PDF UA standard, I know that they gave it away for free for a while. I'm hoping that it's still for free. I haven't actually looked, but in the uh, table 336 standard structure types for list elements, it talks about the tape, the, the list item and the LBL and L body. And in fact, it tells you that you can have a a list item can contain one or more LBLs and L bodies. And the reason why we figured out that it said more than one, right, Chad, was because what was that reason for? Well, yeah, we, we were talking about this. Um, I, I think there, I think potentially there's two reasons, right? One reason is for the instance of nested lists, right? right. Where, where when you have a, so uh, l- let me try to paint this picture, right? You've got a, you've got a numbered list, one, two, three, four, but on list item number four, you've got three bulleted items that right. fall underneath 
uh, you know, number four. So in, in the tag structure, the, the bulleted items are its own list. Right. That lives typically inside of the L body. Yep of the list item number four in the example that I'm giving here. Right. right. So, so, so you have kind of a, a list inside of an L body inside of an LI and it's nested accordingly. And that's how, um, what am I trying to say? Um, subordinate lists are structured, sure. you know, within, within the tag structure. Right. And, and I mean, I, I'll tell you, I mean, you, I think you and I are on the same page with this. I'm a huge advocate of not overly complicated list structure. I, I really tell people no more than two levels deep. And that's yeah. my own preference because oh, sure. I've had user. Ex- I've, I literally use a screen reader every single day. I, I try to keep really, you know, cons- I'm trying to, to really force myself to consider, to consider myself as a, as a native screen reader user. The more I use it, the more I get comfortable with it. And it helps me with my dyslexia a little bit too. So, um, but what I know is that I've been on do- in documents where I have like five levels, like the entire meeting notes for a meeting is all yeah. bullets one way or the other. And to hear list level one, list level two, list level three, list level one, and it going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth is so mentally taxing that it's un- uh, it's almost unlistenable. For for me, it's so easy to get lost. Yeah. L- like as I'm reading this, you know, because I think it's it's a significant mental exercise to in your brain try to remember where exactly you are in the hierarchy. Yep. Right. And, and so I love your recommendation of no more than two levels deep because uh, I think that's plenty. If you go further than that, I mean, before you know it, because every time you go to a new list, it says list with so the example I gave earlier, yeah, you know, numbered list, it'll say list with seven items. Well, you get down to number four. And, and you read number four, and then it says list with three items. Well, right. that's the list for the three bulleted bulleted list items. Right. Now, if you have sub items of the bulleted list, yeah, each gets... one of the bulleted items has a list with so, and, and I yeah. get lost. I mean, I, I really struggle with it. So that that would be a great thing. I, I'd love to get feedback from native screen reader users to understand how they feel about that, right? Well, you know, what their experience is, because I got to believe it's really easy to get lost in, in that web of, of a nested list. Well, I know for sure it is for me. So as I, as I go through that list and, and trying to, to remember where I'm at, and sometimes it doesn't matter where you are in the list. You're just hearing that that list of its own, but Mm -hmm. trying to keep track of things that have a hierarchy that have a meaningful level association that just really make it a heading guys just split it out yeah. and make it a heading and give a heading and then start your next list you know maybe just two levels and then another heading and two levels right I, I really feel like if you go beyond two levels look at your structure and identify if you can make your level one a heading rather than a bullet right well and I, I think this is a good time to, to bring this up and I, I think we've talked about this on the podcast previously uh, but, but when you have numbered headings, right. right? Um, and, and so if you're not careful, um, you could create headings where each heading is a list. Well, yeah, right? by and default, some heading, of the, yeah. Yeah. It's tagged as a list right. and you really got to be careful with that because that, that's really not a great user experience, you know, because it's not going to be voiced as a heading for one, right. Which is not helpful. And, and two, it's going to say list, list with one, one item. item, right? Yes. And I would Every say time. a list with one item is not a list. <laughs> it's a pair of socks with one sock. It's not a, so- it's not a pair of socks, right? So, 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 so I mean, uh, to, to, to give everybody a little bit of, you know, again, uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but the way to get around that is like, if you're doing this in word, um, feel free to use the, the, the automatic numbering feature but make sure you map that style to a heading tag or yes. to, to a heading level. Yep. And then that'll tag it as an, an as an H tag instead of a, a list. Yep. And that'll be a much better experience. Yeah. And while we're talking about numbered lists in Word, remember that if you make a some let's say you use Arial Bold and you know for your heading, your heading, uh, or Arial heavy, I guess. 
And then you press that little B key to make it bold. You basically said, here's a bold font and I want you to add an extra bold on it. Cause I just want it to be that little, little bit more bold, but boldify what, it again. Yes. <laughs> what happens to your numbered list is there's a hidden checkbox on export from word that says, if there's a missing font, change the text to a graphic. And what that does is you'll go into your PDF and go, why are all my headings tagged as a figure? And I don't understand this. And it's usually just the number for whatever reason, it's just the number because word can't figure out how, what a font Arial bold, bold is. So it says, well, we don't have that font, so I'm going to make it an image. And so you end up with some or part or all of your heading for that 1.3.2 is tagged as a figure. Very frustrating. You can uncheck that box on export and it solves it, right? But yeah, the better way is pick a different font or just be okay with Arial bold being Arial bold. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, that, that's one of the things, you know, uh, pe people are probably tired of hearing me say this, but it's one of the things I love about InDesign is that it doesn't let you do that. Like right. in InDesign, you, you pick your font family and you pick your style, whether it be bold, italic, bold, italic, whatever. Yep. And there's nothing more than that. that that's yep. all you can do. You can't double stack. bold it or yeah, you, yeah, can't, you can't stack, stack overrides. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so that's, so that's a thing, right? Um, The, the, the other thing, so what we've, we, we want to talk about another thing, though, that relates to the list. It's kind of a, a companion of checking for the LBL, right? Is that when you have a footnote, oftentimes in some programs, they will export the number of the footnote as an LBL. So you'll have a, a reference link at the bottom and inside that reference will be your LBL and then the text. And Acrobat will say, uh-uh. It will give you a yeah. fail. It will say an LBL, not a, uh, not, or not a child of a list. I think is, I'm not exactly sure what the exact error is, but it says, Hey, your LBL is outside of the list structure inside yeah. Acrobat. When you go into the Acrobat checker, you can actually uh, find a feature in there in the checker. So if you go to accessibility and then accessibility check, there's a drop down in the middle where all the check boxes are. Typically it's on page content or document. Um, uh, actually it's typically on it's by default, it's on forms, it's, tables, and lists lists. Yeah. 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 And so if you look down at the bottom, you, you should have table summaries unchecked, but then at the very bottom of that, it says LBL and L body must be children of an LI. If you uncheck that, it will remove that false error of the LBL because it is fine for an LBL to be a child of a reference tag, right? I mean, that's normal for, for it to be the child because the LBL is the numbered system for that piece of text. Right. And, and I hear what you're saying. I mean, an LBL can also be a child of a paragraph. Agreed. Right. Totally. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it can, you're right. I think, I think in the example, yeah. Yeah. Endnote or footnote. If the endnote or footnote is tagged as a reference, then it can it can it can have the LBL as its own, you know, kind of solitary item. So, I mean, I, I've I've always I, I don't I, I mean I I get that it works and I, and I get that it's valid. It just never really made a whole lot of sense to me. Like from from a logical standpoint, like mm -hmm. I prefer the reference tag. Right. Sure. Like if I'm, if I'm going to have a footnote reference and, and, and again, like I said, whatever your, your preference is, is totally fine. Um, but you know, for me having a label inside of a P tag, it's, it just seems odd to me, but well, but, you know. but here's the thing we have to remember as remediators, we always get caught up in this, I don't know, a need, need the need to change things. And if my program exports it out with an LBL, do not spend, I'm not spending the time changing that well, LBL because I prefer it a different way and vice versa. If your program change does not include the LBL, but you're like, well, but it's supposed to be and, and PDF UA yeah. says it can be this way. Don't spend the time if it's not going to have a net result. First of all, the first thing is you need to comply with the standard. 
period. Right. Mm -hmm. The second of the second thing you should be doing is don't change things unless it's a barrier. Right. If you look at a, 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 an, I, I was looking at a document yesterday and it had two columns of links and I thought, oh, that's a list. And I thought, but is it, does it, is it a barrier that the end user doesn't know it's a list of 11 items in this case? I thought it was because if I hear additional resources, heading level two list 11 items, that tells me how many items are in that resource area. It's providing me important information rather than just hearing link, blah, 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 link, you know, whatever the thing is 11 times in a row. But oftentimes we find that people will just change something because, well, they think it's a better way or they think it's, it's, it's a easy, it's, it's more logical to be this other thing. And I'm like, well, yeah, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to re remove barriers, right? Well, and, and I guess, so, so I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. I think you got it to find barrier, right? Because I'll tell you what pops into my head. My client, when I submit my remediated file to them, they like to run my file through the Acrobat Accessibility Checker. Sure. To verify compliance. Yeah. Right. And, and what you just explained to our audience, um, without turning off that option, they're going to get an error on all those label tags. True. Yep. So, so I, I think, you know, barrier is a, a broad term, right? Like, like we typically refer to barriers from an accessibility standpoint, but if my client is going to be checking these documents arguably inappropriately, that becomes a barrier for me because well, every time I... they, and not an accessibility barrier, I'm just saying from a workflow standpoint, true, that's going to become a challenge for me. So I may take the time for that particular client, pull it into common look, say, find every label that's a child of a P tag or a child of a reference tag, change it to reference. and. That, that probably wasn't a good analogy, right? Uh, any label that's a child of a P tag, change, change it to, it a, to a P. Well, the LBL is going to be just the number, right? Right. So you're saying Which change the number a to a, re a reference. Yep. But isn't the whole thing the reference and not just the number? What, what do you mean the whole thing? You mean the note? Well, the note, yeah. So if it says one you know, Sacramento society of whatever. So in the case of a footnote, the number one or two or whatever is the reference tag. And then the footnote itself is a note tag, right? And, okay. and most programs, the way they'll structure that is in the tag hierarchy. You'll have the, the reference and right below it is going to be the note tag. That's how it's going to structure that. That's how InDesign structures it. That's how word structures it. It just kind of puts it in position within the, the, the tag structure. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I think that again, what, the, what we want to impart onto our listeners is that spending time to change the tags tree solely because you believe it's a better user yeah. experience is something you should try to avoid or be very judicious about what you're doing. Because yeah, you may be making a better user experience, but the client's not paying for that. The user may not know or care about the difference. And in a production environment, we got to get through stuff. And one of the complaints oh, yeah. we hear all the time is accessibility takes too long. And you start talking yeah. to them and they're like, well, but I changed this and I changed that. And I'm like, yeah, you're doing all that as a preference that doesn't, you know, part of what we're doing is do no harm, right? Well, and again, I think in general, a lot of us will get sucked into this making a decision based on our opinion. Yes. Right. That's, yeah. You know, we, we, you know, and, and I highly encourage everybody, like when you, if you're doing something in a file, make sure it's based on fact, right? right? Like make sure that what you're doing, you're doing it purposefully and because it is a problem or a barrier. Don't do it because you're like, I think it should look like this. Avoid right. that because that'll get you in trouble and it'll waste a lot of your time, right? Yeah. 
and, and Dax, you and I see this all the time where, where like how many, how many people have come to us and said, Oh, I'm going in and removing all those span tags inside of a P tag. Right. And we're like, why? And yeah. they're like, well, because they shouldn't be there. And we're like, well, I, I don't know that I agree with should or should not be there. I think the reality is that assistive technology doesn't really voice them if you use assistive technology properly. Right. So, so I just want a little clarification on the use of a note or and the reference tag, right? Okay. So a note, according to PDF UA, a note is a an item of explanatory text, such as a footnote or endnote, that is referred to from within the body of a document. It may have a label, LBL, as a child. The note may include as a child of the structure the body text that it refers to, or it may include or may be included elsewhere as in an endnote. Um and accessed by means of a reference, okay? So tag PDF does not prescribe the placement of the footnote in the page order, right? This is the conversation we always have. Where do we put the footnote? Does it go after the, right after the reference in the paragraph, at the end of the paragraph or at the end of the page? Obviously that's a whole nother conversation. A reference tag is a citation to content elsewhere in the document. So really, the, okay, I guess they are the same thing. I would, I think I read this initially as a reference is something referred to outside. So like an external hyperlink or something. So I read that wrong. So both a note and a reference are considered links or, or tags that identify content linked somewhere else in the document. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, and I mean, understand, I mean, I mean, and again, you know, these are things you would discover as you test documents with assistive technology. Right. Um, the, the, the ref, if, if a number, if a, if a, if a number is tagged as a reference, you don't know it. Right. No, that's assistive very true. Assistive technology doesn't voice it. You know, it doesn't say reference one. I mean, I think that would be super helpful. Right. And, well, and that's and I mean, why, go ahead. Well, well, you and I have talked about the, this conundrum in the past, right? Like if you have a sentence that ends in 2024, like the sentence is, uh, these were the statistics for the year 2024, right? And let's say you put a reference after 2024 for a number one. Right. It's going to be voiced as 20,000. 240, 241. Right. Because it includes Sorry, the number. I need number. to write this down. Yeah, I'm doing I know, it in huh? my head. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? It voices it as one giant big number. This right? is why, but this is why, why my preference is that you yep. make a reference a link because then the end user will hear link one. Right. And we go a little further than that by, by making the, uh, putting it inside brackets. So you get a left bracket link one right bracket, and then the user can then activate that link to go to it or not. If you don't, there is no way for the end user either. If you don't include brackets at minimum, or you don't make it a link at minimum, one of those two approaches, there is no way for the end user to know that it is a superscript reference yeah. to the footnote or endnote. Right. Yeah. I, I think it's one of those areas where I, I really would love Jaws and NVDA to to kind of step that up a little bit and and just voice those references because yep. it, it would it would really clarify things quite a bit, you yeah. know, because because right now it can be really confusing. Well, uh, and if but, you but want you're, some... you're right, I I love your bracket. Yeah, you, you, you had told me that years ago yeah. about putting the brackets around the reference. And I love that because it just naturally separates the reference from whatever preceded it, you know, right. or, or yeah. Yeah. And if you want more examples of note and reference tags and how you kind of combine or use them, um, the tagged PDF best practices syntax guide, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> 4.2.7 and 4.2.8 
ha- are the sections for re- for note and reference. And in both cases, they show you the note is specifically shows you examples of a P tag with a reference tag inside it with an LBL and then a note with the LBL. So basically the reference that it's being referenced that is being used and then the note in which contains the the text for that reference. So how those pairs work together, it's a really good example of, of what that is. And then for the reference, it talks about the use of a reference in a TOC, right, Chad? And that's kind of our segues right into our next topic, which is yeah, the, the, the next nested set, which is a TOC, right? Yep, yep. So, you know, the, the TOC, um, I, I think I can, I can with assurance say this, that the only way you're going to get a TOC uh in your resulting PDF is if you use the table of contents feature in the source application. Yep. So whether it be InDesign, whether it be Word, PowerPoint doesn't have a TOC feature. Um, But, but the only way you're going to get it is, is using a source application. And, and it's a really good thing because that feature does so much for you. Yeah. Right. So not only from an accessibility standpoint, is it going to tag it correctly? But it also makes every entry of the TOC a link that both cited and users of AT can follow to get to that section of the document. I right. mean, it's it's hugely beneficial to everyone. Well, it's really like having bookmarks. So we realize that, what is it, F6 in Acrobat is the hotkey that bounces you from the bookmarks bar to the ta- the the menu at the top and then to the page content itself and it's cumbersome to get back and forth between those so if you are an assistive technology user and you want to activate a bookmark you've got to press f6 to remember where you are get to the bookmarks and then yeah. press f6 twice again to get back to the regular content so the poor principle robust says that there should be multiple ways to navigate your document and the bookmarks is one way to do it but also if you have a TOC, it's an on-page bookmark set that doesn't yeah. require the user to jump back and forth between the windows. The problem most people have is they hear chapter one, link, link two. And they're like, well, why do I hear link, link? Well, the reason you hear link, link is because a reference tag is announced as link when it comes to a TOC. So you hear link when you when it gets to the reference tag, and then what do you have inside the reference tag? Another, Another link. link. <laughs> <laughs> and so you hear link again. So you'll, so most of the, several of the automated tools that export a PDF with a TOC will have a reference and a link tag. And it's not wrong to have it. It's just that assistive technology interprets it incorrectly. And so you hear link, link. And so what you can do is simply remove the reference tag and have the P tag for, you know, you have a TOC for your TOC, your normal, your main heading, then a TOCI for each item, then inside the TOCI is a paragraph. And then you can just simply remove the reference tag and have the link tag be the next tag. Um, and that will solve it. If you're using common look, the easiest thing is just hit, select the TOC, hit delete, highlight the TOC and hit the TOC button and it automatically generates an entire perfectly coded TOC, um, which is super great. So um, we love, I love that tool. But if you're not using common look, you can just go into the, the tag structure and remove those reference tags while leaving your link tag so that the end user gets the, you know, introduction link five, you know, page five or whatever. Yeah. The case. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, that's another, I'll bring this up again, right? Uh, The the table of contents is not voiced by assistive technology, right? Like you would think like, like, you know how when assistive technology reads a list, it says list with 12 items. I would love for it to say table of contents containing 15 items, you know, and, and you can navigate through there. I think that would be a, a really helpful thing, but as of now, it's it's not really voiced. Now, I don't think it's really hard to figure out that you're in a TOC because, um, you know, it's going to say, again, a classic example, chapter one, 15, 
you know, chapter two, 27, whatever. Um, but will it though, Chad, typically it'll say chapter one, 35 dot two. And why does it do well, that? Well, NVDA will do that, right? NVDA will say, you know, chapter one, 87, 15. And you're like, what, what am I hearing? What does that mean? Well, what it's, what it's telling you is chapter one followed by 87 dots, which is the dot leader, if you will, right? The dot leader right. going across. So say chapter one, 87, and then I'll read the number for, for where the page number, right? So I'll say chapter one, 87, 15. And you're like, I don't know what that means, you know? Yeah. So, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up again. I, I recently, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I recently created a video to show you how to artifact those dot leaders in Adobe InDesign. You can artifact them in a PDF as well. And you should upload you know, that I, video to our YouTube channel, Chad. We're, we're, for those of you listening, right? We have quite a few, we, we have quite a few listeners. We get about, about 1500 podcast downloads a month, somewhere between 15 and 1800. We have, about 300 YouTube followers. So if you're not following <laughs> us on YouTube, that would be great. Go follow Please us do. on YouTube <laughs> so we can get to a thousand so we can turn on some of the other features that we can get when we have that many followers, uh, which includes transcripts and some other things. But um, uh, yeah, Chad, you should upload that to our, our YouTube channel. And uh, for those of you listening, there's lots of other really cool stuff on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, and that is uh, good good things to to know. Um, there, but there Chad, is. you wrote, so you wrote this article about how to, how to create a TOC in InDesign that artifacts the dot leaders automatically. That's, that's really great. And it's a really great approach in common. Look, there's actually a button that is, uh, artifact dot leaders and you just press it. I think that's the right. biggest takeaway here though, is, is that you would never know that user experience we just described, unless you were testing your document with a screen reader. Yeah, yeah, well, because well, what I wanted to tell you, you're right. NVDA does what we just described. It'll say chapter one, 87, 15. JAWS will say chapter one, dot, 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 right. 15, right. right? JAWS takes a slightly different approach on, on how it lets you know. And I think I like JAWS's method a little bit better, right? Like sure. I could deal with dot, dot, dot a little bit easier than I can 87, 15, because it gets so confusing so quickly. Yeah. Um, but, well, and if you have a yeah. numbered TOC, then it's really hard because you hear, you know, if your chapters are oh. 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4.5.6, .1 you're going to hear 18.1.4.5. Oh. I mean, it's going to be wrong. You're making my brain hurt. I know. You're making I know. My, as I, as I, know. I think about it, I'm like, man. So, so yeah. It, and that's the value of testing with a screen reader, right? right? You know, people are like, do I really need to do this? Those are the things that are going to rear their ugly head while you're testing. Yep. And, and those are the things that make us, that's, those are the, the, the cases where I would, I would try to go the extra mile and be like, you know what? I do not like this experience. How can I make it better? You know, even if the client's not willing to pay for it, if it takes me 10 minutes, okay, yeah. 10 minutes, I can, I can deal with that. If it takes me two hours then I'm probably not going to do it. You know what I yeah. mean? But well, I and, and the other thing to think hours. about, the other thing to think about in the TOC structure, and we see this all the time, people want to inject headings into the TOC structure, right? They want a yeah. heading level two, heading level three, and they want to compartmentalize it. What you need to remember is that yes, you can use headings, but every time you break your TOC up with a heading, you need to start a new TOC. So if you've got, chapter one and then your TOC, but you made chapter one text say heading level one, then just that little bit is a TOC until you get to the next heading. You should never have H1, H2, H3 on down the line embedded into your TOC. It's an improper use of a heading level structure element. So um, just know that they, it's okay to have several TOCs in your document. You might have a TOC for the figures and a TOC for the tables and a TOC for your body content or the appendix. All good, all fine. They just need to, need to be separate TOCs, right? Now that there's one other thing we wanted to bring up, Dax. I know we're, we're kind of running out of time here, but the, the other example of, uh, you know, nested 
tag structure is is for tables. Right. right? Um, and, and I mean, fundamentally, a table is compliant if you have a table tag. Inside of the table tag is table rows. And TRs, within the yep. rows are your cells. Yeah, TRs right. and then within the TRs, uh, TD or THs. Um, however, uh, and again, this kind of goes back to the source application. Some source applications like to divide the table content up into T head, T body, and, and then while we're at it, T foot. Right. right. There, there is a T foot that could be used. You hardly well. ever see T foot. Though. I know. Yeah. I, Nobody I, really I, puts a running. I, I was trying to explain to somebody, somebody asked me about that. They're like, when do you use a T foot? I said, well, if you had a financial table that had a total row at yeah. the bottom that you wanted to stay present on every page as a person kind of went from page one to page two to page three to always see that running total, that's where you might see a T foot, but you hardly ever see it. The reason you see the T head T foot or the T head T body T foot is when you highlight that row in word or in InDesign and you say, this is my header row or in word, when you say, repeat this header across uh, the uh, pages, then that triggers the use of a T head and a T body. The problem becomes when that T that table spans multiple pages, you get T head, T body, T head, T body, T head, T body for every page. And so as remediators, it's, it's frustrating when you first start out because we tell you, look, visually you need that. You want that so that someone looking at the page can have reference for every page. But for someone using assistive technology, you don't want to have that repeated in the data. So on one hand, it's a necessary function of visual accessibility, but it's a, a barrier for for people who are using a, a screen reader, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, at its core, what you're describing is accessibility in a nutshell. Yeah. Right. Because the repeating headers are beneficial to sighted users. For, for a sighted user, if you only give me one header at the top and I go eight pages in looking at this table and I'm on page eight and I'm like, oh, what, what's that header? And then I got to go back to page one to figure that out. That's a horrible experience, right? Yeah. So for the sighted user, it, it's it's valuable to have the repeating header. For a user of AT, it's 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 unnecessary at best, right? And and it's disruptive at worst, right? right. Because you're forced to read that header over and over again throughout the table, which is not a great experience. So, um, and, and then you know, again, kind of going back to what we were talking about. T head, T body, T foot is not voiced, right? right? You, you would never even know that they were there. I think the benefit is more for the person remediating the file than anything. Well, and at this point, the idea of the T head, T foot, T body is that some future technology might rework how it displays the table to you. Maybe mm -hmm. it's mobile, maybe it's an app or whatever. And so it needs to know what region is the header for that table. And so it does have a purpose. However, you know, it's it's definitely a pain in the butt to have to go in and remove all of those T heads. The nice thing about Common Look is you because Common Look automatically artifacts anything you delete, you can just go in, select them all and hit delete and you're done. Sure. And, sure. and, and even in access PDF, same thing, you can go in and delete those. And then you run the, click the button that says artifact non-tagged elements and they're all artifacted. So, yep. you know, e yep. either way, those tools, you know, we talk about these tools all the time, guys, the tools are there to make it faster. They are not yeah. required, yeah. but boy, let me tell you, after doing this for as many years as we've been doing it, I would much rather spend five minutes on a table than three hours on a table. And, and that's a realistic estimate in some circumstances. And I really hope we don't come across as salespeople when we bring yeah. up these products, because that's not the intent at all. Yep. It's, it's really just about working efficiently. Right. Yeah. And, and what you just said, Dax, I and mean, what I love about access PDF is I prefer to walk the tags tree in Acrobat. Yep. I just think it's easier than easy, even easier than in access PDF. And because I know in access PDF, with the click of a button, I can artifact anything that's not tagged. I'll delete that row, yep. that yep. repeating header row in Acrobat. I'll just be sure. like, delete. Where I normally 
tell people not to do that because if they're relying on Acrobat as a remediation tool, you can't do that. That causes a new error, which is going to be untagged content. So to do it properly in Acrobat, you need to right click on all the marked content and say, change tag to artifact. Right. That's kind of annoying, right? It's it's but a lot ability, of extra work. It is. But but knowing that I have access PDF in my back pocket, I just go delete, delete. I just get rid of it. And yep. that way, when I take it in there, I just say artifact everything. And it's it's really nice. It's a really nice workflow. Um, I was going to say one more. Oh, and then the other thing with the tables, T head, T body. If you use T head, you have to use T body. Right. You can't just have T head or you can't have a T body without a T head. Right. And, and I'll tell you when that happens, those of our, those of our uh, listeners who are InDesign users, if you have a table that does not have a column header, but only has a row header, right? You typically in InDesign natively, there's nothing you can do, right? All you could do is kind of let it go. The problem is that InDesign will automatically tag everything as a T body, right? Uh-huh. And, and we can yeah. argue that InDesign is messing up. InDesign should know better than to be able to only put a T body in there because it's going to cause a problem for us, right? Yeah. So, and the fix is, you know, in the PDF, just drag the rows out of the T body and then delete the T body, right? right. That, that's how you fix that problem. Well, and in common look, you can say find all children of a T body or sure. find all tags that have a T body as a, a parent and level them up, right? Which is really, yeah. really nice. Um, it would be level up children, right? Right. Yeah. Level, level up. up children. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I was going to say something else and I have forgotten what it was about the tables. Um Oh, just just know, guys, that if you have a table and you're thinking about using the caption tag, PDF UA says the caption should be the first or last child of the table tag. However, assistive technology, NVDA and JAWS will not read a properly nested caption. So if you're going to use the figure 4.5 table three as a caption, just keep it as a caption tag outside above the yeah. table or below the yep. table, but be consistent in how you use it either above or below every single time. So we should do another podcast on tables, just in general kind of best practices for tables. We should definitely do that. So that sounds like know. fun. Yeah. Um, Chad, as we close out, I want to let people know that our next three classes, you are teaching all three of those classes. So we have, um, coming up actually when this podcast airs, um, it will be the next class will be in design on March 7th in design accessibility, best practices. And then the following class will be accessible forms, which you, we do cover word and the struggles of word to PDF forms, but it's mostly about in design and how to use in design to, to create a form that is compliant, that can get you all the way to the finish line or mostly to the finish line um, and not having to do a bunch of extra stuff in the PDF. So if you guys are listening to this podcast right now, we're going to give you normally we, if you follow us, you know, we always give you $75 off. That's kind of our norm. I'm going to give you a hundred dollars off either one of those things. So use the coupon code podcast at checkout and it will take a total of a hundred dollars off each one of those courses. Chad. Wow. That's a deal. That's yeah. a deal, man. So, um, and we only take about 15 people per class period. We keep our classes small because we want you to have that unique experience of being able to ask us questions and really get those answers that we can spend that time and make it individual. And what we found is any more than 15, the class starts to get unruly. But if you've got a team, of more than that, and you want to schedule us to do a private class, we're happy to do those. We do three and six hour classes and they're, they're pretty cheap. If your team's, you know, more than 10 people, you, you know, they, they work out better than the online classes. So, yeah, I would say even five, even five yeah. people, I think, I think it's still a, a pretty decent. Five's kind of a wash between the online class and the, the in-person. Yeah. But the nice thing about the in-person, the private class is we use your material. We talk through your stuff. Yeah. It's personalized to yeah. you. And you may not want to share all that with the rest of the people in the public class. So anyway, yeah. Awesome. 
All right, guys. Well, thank you everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, I hope you hope you gained some insight. Uh, I, know, I know we kind of dove into the dregs of of nested, uh, you know, tag structure, but I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something, uh, and, and uh, it'll help you with your your remediation uh, moving forward. Um, I just want to remind everybody, you know, uh, we had mentioned at the beginning of the the podcast that Dax and I are going to be at CSUN. Uh, in March of this year. And Dax and I are going to be doing a pre-conference session at CSUN on Monday, uh, which is entitled Beyond the Checker, Mastering PDF Accessibility Evaluation. So if you're going to be at CSUN and you're looking for for a class to attend, there's still uh, room uh, and you you still can uh, sign up for that. And then throughout the week, uh, Dax and I are going to present, be presenting individual sessions. Uh, Dax is going to be presenting Beyond Compliance, Three Techniques for Better Infographics. And yep. I'm going to have to sit on that one because I know it's going to be <laughs> awesome. Um, and then he's also going to be doing PowerPoint to PDF, Overcoming the Pain Points. And anybody who's ever created PDFs out of PowerPoint knows the challenges of, of PowerPoint. And then I'm going to be presenting uh, Bridging the Accessibility Gap Between Microsoft Word and PDF. So uh, we we hope to see you there and uh, hope uh, hope we get to meet uh, some of you out there at CSUN. Thank you all for uh, listening today. My name is Chad Chilius. And my name is Dax Castro, where each week we unravel accessibility for you. Thanks, guys.